The following video was produced by the Colorado Governor's Office of Energy Management and Conservation. It demonstrates how waste wood from forest thinning operations can be used to generate power. This video features the Boulder County District Heating Project, but the technology can be used to heat a wide variety of buildings. For additional information, please refer to the accompanying handout or contact the Governor's Office of Energy Management and Conservation. why we started looking at a wood-fired heating system for our campus here is because our perspective as parks and open space is we manage the natural resources and we're out in the forest doing forest thinning to reduce the chance of wildland fire and to improve forest health but in the front range we don't have an outlet for the biomass that comes off those forests. In the past uh, our thinning materials would have either been put into slash piles or lopped and scattered or could have been chipped and put back onto the ground or some of the products would have been used for post and poles or firewood but uh, what makes it different now is that we just turn all of that into chips the needles the branches the main bowl of the tree are all turned into chips and uh, that's processed into the uh, materials we use for the uh, biomass plant. So we were looking for an outlet for all the product coming off of our forest thinning projects. At the same time, um, we heard about new technologies out there using biomass for energy. And the value of that is that it's a renewable resource. So we have that renewable resource at our disposal in our forests here in Colorado. And we thought, what a perfect match. We were just in the process of establishing this new campus with five buildings. and we could use this excess product that we're taking off the forest to generate energy to provide the heat for these buildings. After we heard about the potential of using forest products to generate energy for a heating system for our complex here, we decided to find out if it really was something we could do here in our county. And our first step in that process was sending our facilities staff who actually run our heating and air conditioning systems out to look at a similar system. So we sent them to the East Coast where there are systems that have been in place for 15 or 20 years. And they looked at the technical side of it. And they came back and said, this is a proven technology. It's simple and straightforward. It's not something that is going to add to our workload substantially. So they said, we're on board. We like this technology. We would support if you pursue it. Then our next step was having a feasibility study done. We contracted with McNeil Technologies to conduct a feasibility study. What they found out, in a nutshell, is that um, we needed about 65 acres of our forest to supply heat for this complex of five buildings. They found out that the initial costs um, certainly were higher than putting in a natural gas system. The feasibility study found that um, in a worst case scenario where natural gas prices are low and we're paying for the total cost of our forest thinning, the payback period was expected to be about 20 years. And the system's lifespan is at least 20 years, possibly more. Now in the best case scenario with natural gas prices rising, and the fact, taking into account the fact that we are thinning our forests anyway, the payback period was seven years. We infer additional costs uh, from the standpoint that um, we have to have the transportation in order to get this material down here. So it takes the fuel in the truck, it takes the person that's going to drive the truck uh, to get those materials down here. So that would be, you know, some additional costs. But other than that, everything else is already done in just on Boulder County Parks and Open Space, we, we project that we have about eight, about eight years at least that we can uh, get chips off of our property and these are areas that are accessible to us that we can use. 
but beyond that, we have areas that will be able to re-enter uh, within the next five or ten years that were thin maybe five or ten years ago. So we have re-entry, so it being a renewable resource allows us to be able to go back in and look at these areas and continue to produce uh, these materials. However, we do have other areas uh, working with the U.S. Forest Service, working with the Colorado State Forest Service, uh, the municipalities in Boulder County uh, are all areas that we've not tapped into yet where they have uh, programs where they're generating wood material that we can tap into. And then one other area we have is working with uh, private homeowners in uh, uh, land areas up in the mountains where we have homeowner groups that can get together and they could chip into these containers and these containers then could be brought to our facility. So um, there's really lots of other areas so there's quite a, quite a bit of stuff out there that we can tap into. <laughs> Messerschmitt Manufacturing Company out of Michigan uh, was our vendor for our uh, wood-fired system and that includes the delivery system that takes the chips out of the bin and runs them into the boiler, the firebox, uh, the uh, wood boiler and um, the controls for that. All of the other backup boiler, the pumps, the underground piping was done through a different contract, through another contract. Contractually, Messerschmitt provided all of the training for this system for our key personnel. And it was not rocket science. It did not take more than a couple of 20-minute sessions and people were off and running. One key component to installing the biomass heating system was really having all the players on board from the county's perspective. We had to have the facilities managers and the facilities um, employees that are actually going to run the system. We had to have our foresters on board so that the forest products being taken from the forest are handled properly and transported efficiently. And then we also had to have all the decision makers on board as well, including the county commissioners with their financial support and the parks and open space staff who were going to be helping operate it and living with the system here on site and our transportation, which we also shared the site with because we use their expertise a lot in helping design the system and the transportation and the storage of the materials. So a key component is really having all the players involved sit down, talk regularly, um, really have a good vision jointly about how the system can operate effectively for the site. Every morning uh, the operator for the biomass heating system comes in and one of the first things he does is checks the um, level of the chips in the bins and if there are, are if it, it is getting low and it needs to be recharged, he calls the forestry representative who is responsible for getting the chips down from the forest and uh, unloaded into the bin. Uh, the bin capacity, depending on how much heat is needed, is somewhere in the week and a half to two week uh, vicinity. So it's a, the bins are not being filled every day. It's like uh, every week and a half or two weeks they're being filled. When I do the startup procedure, um, I'll first um, open the main box, make sure that all the ash is cleaned out, all of the grates are clear. And uh, then I'll close the main door and uh, get a piece of cardboard and roll it up and slide it in the uh, upper side door and uh, just take my torch and fire the thing up and pretty much goes on its own from there. We usually start the system up at the first of the season and uh, let it run all winter time. Um, unless we have any major failures, uh, we don't have to do a cold start. As soon as um, the boiler calls for heat, there is a traveling auger in the bottom of the bin that is part of the delivery system. It travels the whole long length of the bin and it basically augers on demand, augers chips out the bottom, so it's always taking the oldest chips and getting rid of them. It takes them out the bottom and they go onto a conveyor belt which goes 
and basically dumps into a hopper, which when the hopper is full, shuts off the conveyor system and the auger system so it doesn't bring any more chips. And then from that hopper, uh, it's augered into a metering auger, which then feeds the boiler, the firebox, and the firebox is um, uh, fed with the, with the chips and it has a safety water system so that if fire tries to back up and go back toward the chip bin, it will extinguish it. The object of the uh, wood f a firebox is to heat the water flowing through the boiler which is mounted on top of it and that is then circulated through the pipe distribution system throughout our campus which uh, has a supply and a return line in each one of the buildings. The way the biomass boiler works is it heats the water and then we have insulated piping that goes underground to all of those five buildings. When the water temperature in the system reaches 180 degrees. Basically, the wood boiler throttles back and uh, just maintains whatever it needs to to keep the 180 degree water temperature. When it can no longer keep the 180 degree temperature and, and the water temperature, in fact, falls to 150 degrees, the natural gas boiler that is sitting in the same room uh, recognizes that the wood boiler needs some help and kicks in and heats the water back up to the temperature that's needed uh, uh, for as long as it's needed. It's, it's under local automatic control. Uh, however, there are uh, phone lines that can query it. Our vendor, who is in Michigan and in many other places putting in systems, can get on the phone and call and determine what the error codes are in our system from wherever um, the, the the wood boiler uh, heating system has been completely integrated into our Boulder County system. We clean out the ash about once a week. I like to do it on Thursdays so that I've got a clean box for the weekends. But on the colder days, uh, it can be twice a week. The ash is not harmful. You know, basically it is a good uh, compost. I, my understanding is it helps in gardens. It's helpful for, for that. It's also been considered to be used on some of our streets in the, in the wintertime for, you know, slick roads to be able to, you know, instead of using salt or mag chloride. However, the first study that we did was we didn't produce enough of that to be able to do much of it for the county. So um, it's still under study. They're still determining what they're going to do with this ash. But it is not perceived as a, a big problem. One of our bigger challenges in installing the heating system is really handling the wood in the forest. We had to change the way that we actually handled wood because in the past we would pile them into slash piles and burn them. It wasn't, there was not a lot of emphasis on quality control. Now what we have to do in the forest is as we're thinning we have to handle the wood, make sure it gets chipped and not contaminated. It's an extra step for our foresters in the field to make sure that we are getting the quality product that we need. Well, we uh, have a process where we try to keep the chips as clean as possible. And so in the forest, we have a system to where, whether it's the contractors or foresters in-house, when we uh, do whole tree chipping, we run that through a chipper and uh, try to get it to where we chip all those chips into a container, a roll-off container that's about 30 cubic yards and uh, that way it keeps it clean. We don't worry about rocks and miscellaneous other materials getting in there. And the transportation issue, it's complex because we're basically thinning our forests in the summer and we need the chips in the winter. So we have to make sure that we're storing the chips in an area that's gonna be accessible in the middle of the winter. And there isn't a set up transportation system that we can count on someone else to get the product to the plant on time when we need it. That's our biggest challenge internally, is making sure that we have the chips accessible 
transported down and in our chip facility, ready to burn when we have the highest demand for the heat. The first thing about a chip is it needs to be of fairly uniform size. And it's best described to me in the past as a large um, book of matches is about the size the chip should be. It shouldn't be a skinny, long snag or, you know, it, sh it should be a fairly succinct size of chip and it will move through the augers easier, move on the, the conveyor belts. Uh, I really see this being good for the forest um, because when we uh, thin like this, uh, the number of stems per acre that are on the properties are really quite high. And when we reduce those numbers, it increases the health of those trees and reduces the catastrophic wildfire that can occur in these forests, uh, thereby uh, causing it to where we can have uh, areas that uh, are burned so severely that it takes them a long time to come back. One of the big challenges for installing the biomass system at our current site is that we're adjacent to an airport. And there were definitely concerns about whether burning the biomass to provide heat for our complex was going to have a negative impact on the airport. So once we did the feasibility study and we showed what types of emissions would be expected from this plant, all of those fears were laid to rest. We went through the Colorado State Air Quality Standards and also the FAA, and they approved the construction and installation of this biomass site adjacent to the airport. So with all of, um, all of our research in advance, it was approved to be installed next to the airport. An initial problem we had with our wood chips and the quality of them was uh, the rocks that were getting scooped up when they were scooping up these chips that were stored on the on the floor of the forest for the first chips that we got. And um, basically these rocks have a hard time going through augers, they have a hard time going through uh, places on the conveyor belts. In fact, we had one uh, conveyor belt that we got a little rip in because of a rock got stuck in it. But I would like to say that we have made complete adjustments and gotten rid of all of our rock problems by chipping directly into a container, dumping that container directly into the chip storage bin so there's no opportunity for any kind of debris, extraneous debris to get in the chips at all. It's kind of a, a two-way way of looking at this. There, there are some people who tend to, can be uh, skeptical or s skeptical about this. Uh, because they look at the cost effectiveness and they look at the fact that natural gas is certainly uh, fairly cheap compared to, to lots of other types of energy. Uh, it's fairly clean, that kind of thing. But, uh, but once people come out and see the bio plant and they see how clean it burns and how easy it is uh, to maintain and to operate, I think a lot of those people start thinking a lot differently. Uh, it's uh, you know all automated. Um, it's fairly easy to take care of. Um, we're doing a service out in the forest by getting rid of the materials, not having you know to burn those extra slash piles or having wildland fire is saving the county you know thousands of dollars. Uh, just to fight a wildland fire, fire can run into the millions very rapidly. Uh, so when people you know start to look at that side of the issue and the fact that we're not emitting as much smoke, the smoke that we do emit is a lot cleaner than if we're doing it in a burn situation. Uh, but here, with this kind of a situation, we uh, are starting to create markets now for these chips, and as other people come on board and see the advantages of this, um, it causes uh, entrepreneurial type people to, to want to get into this business and start hauling chips and being in the contract business. So I think there's a lot of positive that's coming out of that. And a lot of people are on one side of the fence or the other, but uh, I've had both of them, but I certainly feel like there's a lot more positive than there are negative when it comes to this. My level of uh, satisfaction for this project is getting it done. And uh, my charge was to keep it simple, which I believe we've done. And every time I turned around, it seemed like somebody was trying to make it more complicated. But we, we tried to keep it simple and straightforward. 
and um, I feel very confident that what we put together here is a no frills basic hot water heating system for five buildings for the county that will pay for itself in a hurry and makes great economic and environmental sense. I feel very pleased with the installation of the biomass heating system on our new facility. I think it was a great opportunity since we were just building this new facility. I think overall it's been a great experience. I think we're all very proud that we are currently the only plant operating in Colorado and we hope that we can be an example for others of how they can use the sustainable resources coming off our forests to provide energy for our for the people in the front range. If you are interested in a biomass heating system for your facility, here are some considerations. Implementing a biomass heating system requires three primary steps. Planning, which includes an analysis and feasibility study. Installation, and operation and maintenance. In the planning stage, the feasibility study should include an analysis of long-term biomass supply and availability. Who are the potential wood fuel suppliers? What is their source? What is the sustainability of the biomass supply? What is the expected fuel cost? An analysis of system sizing. What size system will provide the necessary BTU output for your facility? Determine the appropriate size of the primary wood system as well as the size of a backup system such as natural gas. Determine the wood chip requirements. Estimate your short-term needs three to seven days which determines fuel bunker sizing. Estimate long-term needs four to six weeks for chips stored on site or nearby. And estimate annual fuel use as part of an overall economic analysis. Estimate equipment and construction costs. Determine building modifications necessary to accommodate the new boilers and fuel handling equipment. Compare the cost of a biomass system versus a fossil fuel system in terms of capital and construction costs, fuel costs, operation and maintenance costs. Include an analysis of the expected emissions from the wood-fired system. Do they conform to applicable federal, state, and local regulations? The feasibility study can be performed by in-house personnel, but an engineering firm with some experience in biomass heating systems may be consulted to advise on economic analysis, resource availability, permitting, and other issues. If the feasibility study indicates that the system economics are acceptable, there is a sufficient and sustainable wood supply and there are no technical reasons why the system cannot be installed. Then the next step is to issue a request for quotations from manufacturers and vendors. If there are any emissions limitations they should be specified along with any other special requirements. Fuel planning. You will also need to finalize fuel specifications and fuel supply agreements. It is very important to have a fuel collection and transport plan that keeps the wood chips as clean as possible, and this should be specified in any fuel supply contracts. Fuel moisture content strongly affects heating value, therefore the fuel price should be scaled based on moisture content. Develop appropriate fuel inspection procedures to determine moisture content, quality, and cleanliness. It is also important to ensure that the fuel receiving doors are big enough and that they are easily accessible and that the fuel storage system is compatible with the delivery vehicles. It may be useful to have additional equipment available such as a front end loader or bobcat, a chipper if receiving whole logs instead of chips, or a screen for chip sorting. Installation Installation and operator training is usually provided by the equipment manufacturer or vendor. The biomass heating equipment might be tied into the general building alarm and notification systems. The manufacturer will perform initial testing to make sure that the system is working properly. If additional emissions testing is required by the state regulatory agency, this should be performed as part of the commissioning process. Operation and maintenance. 
Equipment operation includes system startup and shutdown, which might only need to be done once or twice per year. Equipment maintenance includes daily checking of the fuel level, which means the readily available supply of chips, and checking belts and augers for proper operation. Weekly maintenance includes ash removal, which is generally done once or twice per week, and oiling rotating components in the system, if necessary. And on an annual basis, major maintenance is generally performed during summer shutdown and consists of cleaning out the boiler tubes, inspecting all components, and lubricating wear points. For more information, please see the accompanying handout or visit the Governor's Office of Energy Management and Conservation at www.state.co.us forward slash OEMC.